Good evening and welcome to you all as we gather for our third week of um, of our virtual Advent series. And it's just lovely to have you have you with us on the journey. And of course, just a couple of reminders as we begin. As you know, you're very welcome to put uh, any uh, questions that you might have in chat. And as you know, any any question will be welcome, and we we we, uh, we enjoy the opportunity to discuss things to it together, of course. But we'd love we'd love to have your input and questions as well. So as we gather, um, David was telling us that uh, so far we're, we're up to about uh, over twelve hundred registrations. So that's uh, it is great to know that we're able to to reach out in ways that help you in your preparation for the beautiful feast of of Christmas. And as we have always done in any of our gatherings over these uh, over these years, we begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the unceded lands on which we gather today. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and uh, we pray for the day when we will have ears that are sensitive to hear the beautiful spirituality and, and wisdom of our Aboriginal um, brothers and sisters. So Mary Collo, it's lovely to have you back after your retreat. I hope it went really well and just invite you to uh, lead us in our Advent prayer. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. In this Advent of expectation, draw us together in unity that our praise and worship might echo in these walls and also through our lives. In this Advent of expectation, draw us together in mission that the hope within might be the song we sing and the melody of our lives. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in service, that the path we follow might lead us from a stable to a glimpse of eternity. Thanks, Mary. So hand over to Yanina as um, we mentioned last week you know, with Janina, it was snowing in Germany and unfortunately the snow has, has passed and it's gone from snow to slush, it's to slurpees. <laughs> but uh, it'll make it easy to walk around, but uh, just watch out yeah. for any passing cars, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, so we're, And we have some lovely readings once again for this uh, third week of Advent and just over to you, Janina, to, to share with us from our, uh, with, with joy and enthusiasm from, our, from the prophet Isaiah. Thank you, Chris. Oops, let me just. All right, now I'm good. So this, the third Sunday of Advent, as most of you will know, is Gaudete Sunday, or Rejoice Sunday. And that's why all the liturgical readings speak of joy, as you will see. The reading from Isaiah speaks of joy too, but it's a particular kind of joy, you might say. It's not the joy one might feel on a perfect day when everything seems to be in harmony. And it's not the joy over success. And it's not even the little joys of life. It's more a kind of joy that is born from hardships overcome. Joy of, of relief, a joy that is gift. So I'd like to pay some attention on how this reading from Isaiah speaks of joy and on the way, how some New Testament authors have taken quite literally a leaf out of Isaiah's book in that sense. So there are two parts of the reading. It's quite short. It's two verses to each part. And as you see, they are um, they're, they're chosen verses. The first one speaks to us about the gentleness of God and that of God's anointed. The spirit of the Lord God is on me, for the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring the news to the afflicted, to the poor, to bandage, to dress the wounds of the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, release to those in prison, to proclaim a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn. You may be familiar with this text from the Gospel of Luke, because there Jesus reads it, quotes it, um, right at the beginning of his ministry. Um, just a couple of things. So the 
the Hebrew verb for anoint, mashach, is the same root um, as the word Messiah, Mashiach, the anointed one. Um, and, and this anointed person in, in the book of Isaiah is given a clear task here. God has anointed him or her um, for a particular task. In Luke, that becomes sort of a mission statement for Jesus's ministry. Here in Isaiah, it's the voice of an anonymous prophet. And the job description is quite clear. To bring news, intended good news, in the, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, that's specified. Um, it's the same word that's underlying the evangelium, like gospel, what's underlying there. Um, to bandage, I think in some translations it says soothe, but to, to dress the wounds, to, to, to bandage those who are brokenhearted, a beautiful image, um, to proclaim liberty, freedom, release to all those who lack autonomy and freedom and dignity. And to proclaim a, a year of favor from the Lord, and that also involves, that tradition also involves freeing slaves and canceling debts. So, so that is about, we might say, social justice, equality, returning dignity, re restoring dignity to people. And to comfort all who mourn, that verb to comfort is the same one that we had last week when we read comfort, comfort my people. All this is cause for joy. Great joy if you are one of those poor or in debt or brokenhearted or in mourning. Or, of course, if you're in solidarity with them. A little metaphor for that. Now that I'm back in Germany, I can appreciate... Oh, okay, I missed that. That's okay. We leave that. Um, nah. Sorry about that. Okay. Now that I'm back in Germany, I I find I, I appreciate in a new way again the, the whole symbolism about light um, that is to do with many Christmas and Advent traditions. Um, because it is dark and cold... And also because there's no fire danger outdoors. Um, a lit candle is a comforting sight and a welcoming sight. So be it the Advent wreath, um, which people have in their homes, not so much, also in church, but mainly in their homes. Be it, um, this is our front door. There's a little lamp with a candle inside. Most Many houses here have that um, in this village. And it, it's just a welcoming sign you pass by the houses and you see that that warm light now the joy that is hidden in the lines that we just read is a little uh, it's a little like those lights and the darkness and of course light only it only has that effect because it is dark if it was bright sunshine no one would see the candle so the kind of joy here is the relief you might feel when you realize you're not alone when you thought you were or the weight that's taken off your shoulders when things take a turn for the better after they've been bad for a long time so it's this kind of good news that keep you going um, that give you relief and hope second part that speaks uh, more explicitly about joy. I exult for joy in the Lord. My soul, or better, my whole being, rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me in garments of salvation. He has wrapped me in a cloak of saving justice. Like a bridegroom, wearing his garland, like a bride adorned in her jewels. So here that sentiment of joy comes to the fore. I exult, my whole being rejoices. And that first line of verse 10 might have a familiar ring to two because we will hear something very similar in just a few minutes. We will hear, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. And it's a text that is, I think, familiar for many, Mary's song. Again, Luke taking a leaf out of Isaiah. Also before it was Luke. So here, in this case, the joy comes from being wrapped in salvation and justice. 
just like I might wrap myself in a warm cloak in a, on a cold winter's day here, and it protects me from the cold. The cold can't harm me. Or another image that is used like a couple on their wedding day, and they're all dressed up and, and wrapped in beautiful things, beautiful dress, um, jewelry, what have you. But we might ask, with all these beautiful readings we've had from Isaiah, isn't that just utopian wishful thinking? Like God is going to fix everything. Yeah, right. To quote Luke for a change, the other way around, how can this come about? And there the last verse of this reading is really important, I think. It has another image. As the earth sends up its shoots and our garden makes seeds sprout, so the Lord God makes saving justice and praise spring up in the, in the light, in the sight of all nations. And this too is an image that Jesus will take up in its parables, in his parables. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. We know these. A seed, once it is sown, will grow by itself. Sometimes seeds can lie in, in the ground for a long time until they um, start growing. A little care, of course, will help the seed. So the good news is not that God is going to fix the world once and for all in one big glamorous act of, of salvation. That's not Christmas. That's not what we celebrate. The good news is that God has indeed planted the seeds of justice, of freedom, of joy, and like any seed, they will spring up and grow in their own time. And a little care does help there for each other and for ourselves. Joy does have its own dynamics too. It's, it's like a seedling that, that, that is made to grow. Joy is made to spread. It's contagious. And we'll hear a little bit more about joy and a joyful song from Mary Rayburn in just one minute, and I'll hand over to Mary. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Janina. It's really a, a very beautiful reading. And I, I think you really um, helped us to see the depths of it. So uh, today, the responsorial psalm is a canticle. It's from Luke. And it's the Canticle of Mary. Um, so it's it's a, a little bit different. We don't have a psalm from the book of Psalms, but we have a psalm from the book of Luke. Um, and I think it's important that we uh, remember that how Jewish Mary was. And so to help us remember that, and because we were looking at Chesed last week, um, Rabbi Skorka, who wrote a book with Pope Francis uh, a few years ago, wrote an article in L'Osservatore Romano just on the December the 7th, and he said, Jesus, as a Jew, understood the importance of chesed as a divine virtue. This is evident, for example, in the parable of the unforgiving servant, in his saying, be ye perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, and in the phrase he instructed his disciples to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So they're all examples from the New Testament that he sees um, the expression of hesed there. And he goes on, these thoughts come to my mind as I see my Christian friends preparing to commemorate the birth of the one who, according to their faith, so he doesn't share this faith, but he recognises it in us Christians. Um, as we uh, prepare to commemorate the birth of the one who brought the good news of the chesed of God to the wider world. So that's a beautiful affirmation of our role as Christians, as we join, as we are the body of Christ, that we we one of our roles is to bring the chesed of God to the wider world. So we move on. Our response 
to this canticle, to this psalm, is my soul rejoices in God, in, in my God. And it's taken from the first reading from Isaiah 61. And um, I, I think it's important that we recognize that my soul, and Yanina um, mentioned it, at least in passing, it's not talking about the body-soul dichotomy, but the the nefesh, the Hebrew, is it's my being, it's the the totality of my person. Um, so we we rejoice, you know, our whole being rejoices. And the verb to rejoice there is its basic meaning is to spin around and then to be happy and to rejoice. So it's a physical, it's embodied um, as well. And I think that's important. And then my God is the um, Elohim, the generic term for God. Um, but in Isaiah 61, it is in parallel with the sacred name. So it's a reference there too to the sacred name. So that's our refrain, my soul rejoices in my God. And as Yanina said, it's it's Gaudate Sunday. So uh, that is the call to rejoice. And um, I think that's really important. So then the the um the actual canticle is Mary's Magnificat, although there is a little footnote that mentions that in a couple of uh, tra uh, traditions, it's the prayer of Elizabeth, and we'll see in a minute uh, why that might be considered. Uh, Chris will have something to say about it because he's very sure it, Luke intends it to be the prayer of Mary. Um, it's sort of a pause. This Magnificat comes as a pause between the Annunciation of, sorry, of John and Jesus and the, their births. I'm sorry, I, I have made a mistake in the print there. But the, the announcement of John and Jesus, the Annunciation comes first, and then we have this, um, the Visitation and the Magnificat and then the birth of John and Jesus. So it's it's like a pause in between them. It is a, a song of praise and therefore a hymn. And it focuses or it comes to focus on the overturning of expectations. It's really beautiful in that. And we, we see that in, in this overturning, it's a mosaic of biblical texts strongly influenced by Hannah's song in one uh, in the first book of Samuel chapter 2 um, but also influenced by the psalm so the the opening um, line is very similar to Psalm 104 and Psalm 103 as they open so it's a joyful psalm and even that image of God bending towards the poor as we see in Psalm 113 reflected there, praising the greatness of God, God's holy name, again reflected in other psalms. And it's God's action um, which is just and liberating, as Isaiah 61 uh, suggested, and as we see in Exodus, in Psalm 89, um, and many other places that uh, just and liberating action of God, and that's that's part of what Luke has used um, these traditions to to give expression to what we now call the Magnificat. I won't go through them, but just to to list some other Psalm texts that um, are reflected in the Magnificat. Uh, so it it opens with verses 46 and 47, and then gives the reasons for praising God. And so we see by this slide that it's grounded in the First Testament and therefore very Jewish. And I remind you, this is the beginning of the gospel that we often call the gospel to the Gentiles. Um, so it, it's, it, but it's very grounded in the, in the tradition there. So the Magnificat it begins very personally for Mary and soon becomes universal. So in the beginning, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. Why does she rejoice? For he has looked with favour on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. 
for the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. And then it changes and it becomes much more universal. His mercy is for those who fear him, who hold him in awe um, from generation to generation. So past, present and future are gathered up there. And he's shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And we begin to get that reversal. And it, then it intensifies. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, the hungry with good things, and sent the rich away empty. So that's Mary's praising God um, for what God has done in, in her life, but praising God for what God has done, is doing, and will do again. So God has done it in the past. God is doing it in Mary's now, according to Luke, and God will do it in the future. And we have all experienced that. So we're witnesses to that. Um, the, the call to self, my soul um, magnifies or glorifies the Lord. You know, she's speaking to herself, or Luke has her speaking to herself, responding to God, prompting herself to, to respond. And then we have the reasons for the praise, what God has done in her life, and then that broadening, what God does in life. The salvific um, acts of God. And we have we have three women um, hovering around in this, really. Uh, Hannah, because the Magnificat is strongly indebted to Hannah's song. Um, so Hannah and Miriam, or Mary, um, one barren and humiliated by her barrenness, one unmarried and the fear that she will be humiliated by her, her uh, conception, both women of Israel, both in relationship with God and therefore both women models for us. And then the third woman there is Elizabeth, who is, if you like, the witness to the, the Magnificat. And Elizabeth is more like Hannah because she is older and she's barren, and that is both humbling and humiliating in, in biblical times. It's, it's the thing a woman most um, feared almost was, was being barren. And even if, if her husband was the one who, who was unable to conceive, it was always her fault. It was the woman who was always barren. So Elizabeth, too, is a woman of Israel in relationship with God, and she, too, is a model for us. Um, so just to remind ourselves liturgically, the three hymns in the infancy narratives of Luke are used daily in the prayer of the church, the Benedictus in the morning, the Magnificat, as we've looked at today in the afternoon, and the Noctimitus in the night or in the evening. And then the Magnificat is sometimes, as it is in, will be next Sunday, the Magnificat is used as the responsorial psalm. I just wanted to remind us all that this is a very young Mary. Um, I, I think images matter. Um, she's not she's not in well she's in a light color but she's not in blue and white she doesn't have blue eyes she's got lovely olive skin she's a young jewish woman but very young um and i think the the image there just reminds us of that and yet this young woman is the the one upon whom luke puts the uh, this beautiful hymn the magnificat and then finally um, because it is Gaudate, Sun Gaudate Sunday, um, all the readings have this note of joy. Um, Isaiah 61 speaks of integrity and praise springing up. The responsorial psalm praises God for overturning um, expectations. And I think that's a really important part of the Magnificat. The first letter to the people of Thessalonica um, 
God's expectations, and it talks about God's expectations. So, you know, it, it's not the overturning of God's expectations, but but what God does expect. And then in the gospel, I am not the one. So that this this unexpected um, joy and praise. So thank you, and I'll hand over now to Chris. Thanks, Mary. That. Uh... You, do, do you want to say a little bit more about um, uh, that? You'd already given the introduction about uh, Elizabeth. Have you got any anything more that you want to, to say before? I... <laughs> well, just that there are some manuscripts that that um, suggest that Elizabeth, in fact, says the Magnificat rather than than Mary. Um, and I think Hannah and Elizabeth align so much more than. Um, than Mary and Hannah, really. So I can see why um, it is a minor tradition. So you might like to say something about it too before you move no, on. That, that's all right. No. <laughs> okay, thanks, Mary. Now, I, I'd say it's a, a minor tradition, but you can understand why the tradition came, came to be. Um, so one of the interesting things is in terms of the textual tradition uh, and, and comparing the manuscripts, uh, it doesn't really come up in, until you've got some of the the Latin versions in Irenaeus and um, uh, Origen as well, but it's it's given an A rating in the, in the textual uh, apparatus where we've got the really strong witnesses, I suppose, to Mary being the one praying it um, from Sinaiticus and Vaticanus and a whole range of minuscules and magiscules and um, lectionaries and Syriac and Vulgate and Coptic. Um, all sorts of witnesses to it early on and, and some papyri as well. So it's interesting that it's just there, but you can see why they, they thought, no, nah, but this this fits into the Old Testament pattern. Like um, poor old Samson, you know, he, he's poor, he's, uh, his mother, she, she doesn't even get a name, does she? It, it, it's, it's, she's the wife of Manoah. Um, oh. and that's sort of the, the pattern that's there. So um, so you can understand because it turns it around in in, unex, in an unexpected way, but um, the beautiful part thing about the Magnificat is is that it sums up all the the dreams and hopes of Israel in the best possible way. And I think that these early Christians, and Luke in particular, wanted to wanted to basically have Mary giving voice to the the best of the tradition, the best of Israel's hopes and dreams, and dealing dealing with the joys and sorrows of life. You know, and it, it's such a beautiful thing. There's no, there's no doubt about that. So that having been said, <laughs> let's now move on to uh, to Paul, uh, to those uh, that community there in uh, Thessalonica. So. Um, one in many ways, I, I see what what happens in this particular these particular verses as we get to the end of this letter to the Thessalonians, is as um, I might have said before, when you get to the closing chapters of letters from Paul, he has he usually goes into a period of of um, exhortations, and look, don't forget to get it right, and it's interesting here that he he begins with this community um, calling them to gospel joy on the road. Of life, so um, be happy at all times. So pray constantly, and for all things give thanks to God, because this is what God expects. So just a couple of comments about that. But be happy at all times. That um, there's a whole series of um, present imperatives, and you say, "Oh, thank, thanks very much for reminding us, Chris, about what that what that is." Well, it means though, keep doing it. When Jesus says, "Follow me." Um, their present imperatives in the Greek, which means keep doing this. So that the challenge for the for the people in Thessalonica is to keep being happy, to keep praying in all circumstances, keep being thankful for the gifts and graces that you receive. And it's interesting that the translation we've got here, because this is what God expects, but literally what um, what the Greek is saying, this is literally God's will for you. For you to do in Jesus Christ. So it's interesting, isn't it, that with Pope Francis, he's really um, called us to focus continually on this attitude of joy. And 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 beautifully uh, said by Yanina, it doesn't mean, like in Isaiah, that you're always just going to be happy and everything is up, up, up. No, but it's it's about hope. It's about trusting. It's about wrapping yourself. And that beautiful image that you had there, Yanina, of being wrapped in salvation. That that sense of God's comfort. God being with us on the journey too. 
I'm sorry, I'll just uh, go on to play so you get the full screen. Okay. So, but joy, uh, just a little quote from Henry Nguyen. Joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. And this is part of what Paul is trying to remind the, the Christians of Thessalonica and, and us as we go along uh, as subsequent uh, generations. It's a choice. A choice to trust. A, a choice to hope. A choice to be Christian. A choice to care. So for this uh, community, joys and sorrows are part of their life. So this is a, actually a, a, um, a, a photograph taken over Thessalonica when there was a storm. And I thought that might be appropriate uh, for what Paul is trying to say. And right from the beginning of the letter, and you became imitators of us <clears throat> and of the Lord, for in spite of persecution, you received the word with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And one of the things in Paul's letters, when he talks about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a guarantee. It's God's way of being present with us, whatever happens. And those beautiful texts like in chapter 8 in Romans, that the Spirit prays within us. When we can't find the words, the Spirit is taking our prayers, our longings, our dreams and our hopes to the very presence and the very heart of God. So this community have suffered. Um, and, and Paul wants to praise them and to encourage them as he comes to the end of the letter. As Henry Nguyen said in another, another quote, the discipline of gratitude is the explicit effort to acknowledge that all I am and all I have is given to me as a gift of love, a gift to be celebrated with joy. It's not always easy to do, we know that, but that's our call as Christians knowing, of course, that nothing, as Paul would say, can separate us from the love of God, shown us in the love of Jesus. So as Paul goes on in this, uh, this reading there to the Thessalonians, he says, never try to suppress or quench the spirit or treat the gift of prophecy with contempt. Think before you do anything. In other words, actually, it's not think before you do anything, but literally, Test everything and hold on to what is good and avoid every form of evil. So there's a lot of exhortations there in these few verses, both positive and negative in terms of things to avoid. But it's interesting, isn't it interesting these days when, um, when we, we have, we're bombarded with so much information and yet we're invited to, how do we discern? How do we, how do we search? How do we find what's true? How do we discern what's fake news, a thing that we've talked about before? It's not always easy to find the truth in the midst of many untruths, many stories. Just go searching on the internet for any topic and finding out what is trustworthy. And it's interesting there that Paul is not just saying, look, um, uh, no, don't, when you hear uh, different, uh, different prophecies, for example, we're going to talk about that. But when you hear these things, you need to test it. You need to evaluate it. We know that um, St. Ignatius uh, for the, with the Jesuits there, you know, really strong about discernment of spirits. Well, the Pauline communities were wrestling with this too. And they were, they were talking about that the spirits of prophets need to be subject to other prophets. But this ex exercise of discernment is something for us all. So we've all been given the ability to discern and to see into the unseen realms, but make sure you're looking through the right lenses. Well, this is the, the heart of it all, isn't it, as human beings? How to put on the right lenses, to ask the right questions. So we're all called in Pauline uh, thinking to discern what is good. So just some examples from Paul's letters in 2 Corinthians. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you're living in the faith. Test yourselves. That examine of conscience, isn't it? In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Because what was going on in Corinth, of course, was that uh, some of the rich 
were already had their meal before the slaves and the workers came to join in the Eucharist on, on the, uh, for the breaking of bread. Uh, and Paul is saying, but you can't see these other brothers and sisters. Our brothers and sisters, you are humiliating. You need to be aware of yourself. Look to your own heart. Uh, I suppose that's one of the deep calls of Advent, isn't it? How is God working in my life here and now? What am I not seeing? What am I not judging through the right lenses? And for Ephesians, that, that discernment, that search, try to find out what is pleasing to the Lord. Yeah. So for Paul, the Spirit's presence among us is a source of encouragement and wisdom while we wait for the Lord's return. So the Spirit's gifts among the community need to be recognised and nurtured. And that's going to be one of the calls that we're all, all having to discern at this time as we, as we think about the Plenary Council, um, as, as we think about the Synod. So who are the prophets among us? And what are the messages that we are not inclined to accept or pay attention to? Of course, God is speaking, but are we listening? So as Paul goes on and he comes towards the end of the letter, he gives us this beautiful image that holiness is actually wholeness. May the God of peace make you perfect, make you complete, may you, may you get to the end of the journey, make you perfect and holy, and may you all be kept safe and blameless, soul and body and spirit, for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I find that really intriguing. May the God of peace make you perfect. So often we're talking, thinking about our efforts, what we must do. But as Yanina talked about being wrapped in salvation, so too Paul would be reminding us, but God is working as well. And we have to give God room to work in our hearts, in our lives. And as Mary talked about this, we should talk about nephesh, that's the, the person. And I suppose in a text like this, talking about spirit, soul and body, it's not just body and soul, we're talking about the whole person, and this is another way of doing it. And I thought I'd just show you something from Delphi. This is a map uh, or, of uh, that, that site where people would go along, uh, just not, not very far from Corinth, actually, uh, in the, uh, not, not far from there, on the, on the way towards uh, Italy, really, uh, and you had the different levels of the city. But... The way it's laid out, it's interesting, there's the, for the soul, you've got um, the blue arrow there moving towards that central um, temple of Apollo. And then behind that, you've got the theatre, where people would be exposed to plays, rhetoric, the mind. And then right beside the, the, um, uh, the temple of Apollo there on the, the left of the, of the picture we've got here was a gymnasium. Body, soul, and mind, spirit. It's all, it's all there, talking about the whole person. And I think that's something for, for us to think about as we're here at this Advent time. We bring our whole person, not just our, our minds, not just our hearts, to be nourished and to nourish. And so it shouldn't surprise us that we hear in Matthew 22, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. That's the deepest call of Advent. So there's an incoming call from God. Will you accept or decline? God has called you and he will not fail you. Interesting, the Greek says, God will do. So the Greek text to me is much more dynamic than the English. It's not talking about God's call in the past, but it's God is calling. That's the point. Every day, every moment of our lives, God is calling. Are we listening? Will we pick up the phone? So last little quote from uh, Henry Nguyen. The spiritual life does not remove us from the world, no but it leads us deeper into it. And that's our prayer for each one of us, you know, in this time of 
of Advent, that our spiritual journey will lead us more deeply into our wounded and bruised and um, very needy world. Over to you, Mary. Okay, thank you, Chris. So I'm hoping my internet holds up tonight. Okay. So the gospel uh, from is from John. And you'll notice that the first couple of verses are from the introduction, the, the what's called the prologue. And then it starts the actual narrative of the gospel at verse 19. So the prologue says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to witness to the light. You'll notice I keep saying witness because that's what the Greek keeps saying. So we've got testify. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a Greek word. Who are you? He confessed and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. So they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And he said, no, I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So then they said, well, who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, they had been sent from the Pharisees and they asked him, why then are you immersing people, baptizing? If you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet. And John answered, I baptize with water. But among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me, and I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany, across the Jordan, where John was baptising. So once again this week, we're focusing on John, and the question continues, John, who are you? I think this was the question being asked in the early communities. Who was John? How can we understand his mission and its connection to the mission of Jesus? You see, John was beheaded. So horrible death though it was, it uh, wasn't a disgraceful death. So he could be considered to be like a saint. Jesus died executed, humiliated on a cross. So which one should we be following? Now, the names of the people they put to him were figures expected at the end of time. So when they ask, are you the Christ, meaning the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? See, all of the people... First hearing of not all, but most of the people first hearing John's gospel were Jews, so they knew their Jewish scriptures, and these are figures that the Jewish people were expecting because they were awaiting a savior figure at that time, they were dominated by Rome, things couldn't have been worse. There was a strong sense of an evil power at loose in the world, as this image shows. The worlds of God's desire of peace, justice, kindness, this seemed impossible. When surrounded by military power, by greed, by evil, so they are longing for God to come. They cry out, tear open the heavens and come down. So they're looking for an anointed figure, the Messiah, a David, to usher in the reign of God. So to David, God had promised, this is around the year 1000, 
when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. So the beginning of a hope in a future anointed one, a son of David. And then uh, the prophet Malachi has, lo, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. See, Elijah was taken up to heaven in a fiery chariot. And so it was expected. He, he hadn't died and so could return again. And then the prophet is referring to this promise, I will raise up for them a prophet like you, a prophet like Moses from among the people, someone who'd be a teacher and lead the people to freedom. Remember last week how I talked about the way the gospel writers looked to the Old Testament to provide the ancestry, the background for Jesus. Well, here they're doing the same now, looking back to find out who might John be. Some thought John might have fitted one of these hoped-for figures. But in reply, John says, I came as a witness. I am the voice. Now, if we were living in the first century in that culture, this puts John in the role of the best man at a wedding, what's often called the friend of the bridegroom. Now, just make sure you hear that. Speaking of himself as witness and voice, John is taking on the role expected of the best man at a wedding in those times. You see, marriages were usually arranged between families and it was the role of the best man, the uh, friend of the bridegroom, who would act as the deputy for the father of the groom and approach the father of his prospective bride. And the father would immediately call in his own deputy because the two fathers have a lot to lose. If the proposal is turned down, it's a lot a loss of face a lot of shame. So rather than the two fathers thrash out the contract, how much the dowry will be, etc., it's the, these two deputies, the friend of the bridegroom and the deputy for the bride. So it was the friend's job to be the voice for the bridegroom, to speak of him, to extol his virtues to the bridegroom's to the bride's father in the hope that the permission would be given for the marriage. So he was literally the voice of the bridegroom. So if the negotiations continued, then the two fathers could meet, perhaps have a drink together or a meal together to seal the contract. But all the negotiations have already been done by the two deputies. The friend of the bridegroom, the deputy, then would write up the marriage contract. And he would be the one to lead the bride from her father's house to the house of the bridegroom for the wedding. You see, the friend was totally wanting this marriage to take place between the bridegroom and the bride. And this is what John says about his role. He's come as a witness, the friend of the bridegroom. He is not the bridegroom. He doesn't get the bride, but his friend does. And later in chapter three, as you can see, that's who John says he is. I am not the bridegroom. I'm the friend of the bridegroom. And if you've got your Bible, 
you can see immediately after uh, chapter 1, it leads into chapter 2, when Jesus is at a wedding. This image of God's love, God's love for Israel, was often uh, spoken of as a marriage. And at this Cana wedding, there's an abundance of wine suddenly, miraculously, is there. And the steward of the feast, who doesn't know where it's come from, he goes over and congratulates the bridegroom. Obviously, it was the job of the bridegroom to provide the wine. But in this wedding, the one who provided the wine was Jesus. So he is the one taking on this role of being the bridegroom, the manifestation of God's love for God's people. So it raises some interesting questions. Can we imagine that God loves and desires us as much as a bridegroom desires and loves the bride? Just one other comment about John. He knows his place. He's able to say, no, I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. I'm the witness, the voice, the bridegroom's friend. And I think this is John's greatness. His ability to accept his particular role in God's reign, in God's kingdom. For some, this can take years of searching. We don't actually know what John was doing before he took on this role. And it's worth thinking as we approach Christmas, what's my particular God-given role, vocation, in this God venture? What are the particular gifts God has given me? So the question asked to John, who are you, can change into who am I before God? What is God wanting of me? So this week we might pray, come Lord Jesus, come into my life. And then, of course, we need to have eyes open to see this coming. Now, I always have the ads, so here's the first ad. Uh, Christmas gift, Sundays Under the Southern Cross, now in one book, Gospel Reflections for Years A, B and C, again available through John Garrett Publications and the phone number there. Uh, I think David has got some other things that uh, could make good Christmas gifts. And then uh... okay, thanks very much. Hope I didn't go over time, but it was John. Yeah, you're very controlled there, Mary, considering what it might have been. <laughs> there you go. So you've got um, Donna has uh, said, my mum has purchased the Sundays Under the Southern Cross book for me as a Christmas gift. Looking forward to reading it. There you go. So that's great. Now, Elizabeth uh, Young has got a question for you. Yes. Um, and you can see that, yes, so in, in terms of there's a difference between what you've got in the Synoptic Gospels and Matthew, Mark and, and Luke and what you've got in John, so how to interpret it. Yeah, yeah I'd agree. It's just uh, taking from, from the tradition, Elizabeth, I, I don't think John has got copies of the, uh, the Synoptic Gospels in front of him, but the tradition has this language about John saying this statement because I read similar words uh, last week coming out of another gospel, even about I'm not worthy to undo the clasp of his sandal. So 
that language was part of the tradition that the synoptics draw on and John draws on. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's, it's really interesting too for how, how the um, early church dealt with the relationship of Mm. of John the Baptist and Jesus. And in, in Acts of the Apostles, it goes even when Paul goes to Ephesus mm. in chapter 19, verse 3, mm. he meets people who have been, had received the baptism of John and the whole movement of, uh, of John continued in the in the uh, Middle East for, for mm. many, many centuries, in fact. And in Australia. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, I think that's a, the question so far. David, did you want to... Say a little bit while you while you can. Maybe people got some questions they can think about while you're doing a little um, reflection for us. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, um, it's uh, wonderful again to join uh, everybody. And um, uh, I just do want to, if I may, share a an ad or two. Um, Excuse me. There you go. Um, one thing that we do do, aside from these events, um, is that we do do an, a free Advent calendar um, every year. So this year we're looking at the Advent wreath. Um, and so that's just a daily reflection um, uh, that's available to people to spend two minutes, five minutes or longer um, looking at... Um, uh, joy and hope and peace and, and love um, through this gift that we have of the Advent season. So if you haven't, if you're not aware of that, um, uh, there will be a link uh, on the video later in the week um, where you can download the Advent calendar where we've still got a few days to go. So you haven't missed the whole uh, of, of the calendar, but that's something that we do. Um, and that brings us joy um uh to be able to provide that to you wonderful christmas gifts of course from um uh from yanina and um also from mary I, I the friendly guides uh i'll share next week a little secret of a new friendly guide that mary's been working on but you'll have to join us next week mm -hmm. um so curiosity kills the cats but i'll keep you on the edge until next week what do you think mary yeah, we'll tell you next week about your good. next next yeah, you job um the birth of Jesus uh, from Mary Collo. Um, well, this is the time, obviously, um, that this book is, uh, well, it's relevant all year, but certainly at this time. And again, it's not too late um, to share that. Um, Chris has done the friendly guide to the Lost Gospels. Um, so this really is a marvellous resource and something that will be, mm. um, I, I think, new to a lot of people um, that... Uh, uh, Chris has been able to uncover and unpack for us these Gospels that have been lost. Um, um, uh, and one thing that we are doing next year that I'm pleased to say I'm really excited about this, and, and Chris Monaghan has kindly contributed, but so have many other people, including Andy Hamilton and, and Gavin Brown, who's a member of the mm -hmm. YTU uh, um, uh, faculty, um, Peter Manane and, and uh, Michael McGurr has written, the idea of a year of miracles is to take each month and to explore an element of our faith. Um, so, you know, we, we look at synodality and we look at uh, um, ecology and uh, a, a range of other um, areas each month. So it just gives you a little snippet to concentrate your thoughts and reflections on throughout the year. Um, so this is new. Um, it's something that's been, uh, that people have sort of requested from us um, uh, in a roundabout way, um, but we hope to make this an annual, um, uh, an annual book. Um, and let's just explore um, uh, the year um, uh as a faith-filled year um and uh and and just to reflect and in and, and uh um celebrate our faith um that's the idea of it very simple um and so that's available now after some delays due to industrial action on melbourne's ports 
<laughs> pleased to say is uh, well and truly over, just in time for Christmas. Okay. Back to you, Chris. Okay, thank you, David. And thanks to everybody for your lovely uh, comments. They're always uh, very encouraging for us, and we, we love... Um, oh, there's... Uh, Thanks, Lucia. That, that, no, there was a thanks, Lucia, that was <laughs> from from you then, I think. Um, where's there's another question for us? I, uh, no, not. Yes, not right. Michael Smith. Um, oh yes, about. Oh yes, please on that one. Yeah. Yeah, he said, should we refer to Old First yeah. Testament or Hebrew scriptures or whatever? Um, Hebrew scriptures, most of the First Testament is in. Hebrew, um, but for the Catholic canon, some of the the very last books to be added to that are in Greek or were um, found only in Greek. Um, so Hebrew scriptures doesn't perfectly describe the Catholic canon, whereas the canon uh, for the Reformed traditions, which is the same as the Jewish canon but in a different order, um, is in Hebrew. So the term Hebrew scriptures works well for that. You'll have noticed that I tend to use First Testament um, and I don't use Second Testament. Um, so they're, they're, it's almost impossible to find the right terminology and to be absolutely consistent in it. Um, but it makes us think about the relationship mm. of, of the the First Testament and the New Testament, it makes us think about what what are the books that are canonical for us. Mm. Um, and there are some books that are deuterocanonical, uh, were in Greek, that um, are in our Catholic canon that I wouldn't give up for all the world. So it, it, it's a complex um, reality and you have to find something you're comfortable with. Tony Campbell of Very Happy Memory, often said Older Testament and New Testament. Um, the reason Old Testament is sometimes seen as passe and, you know, that's old and it's to be mm. disregarded and that's why I tend not to use it. But others will have other insights into it. Uh, that, uh, that's right. I suppose this is the thing that uh, you can't read the New Testament without being steeped in, in, in the... Uh, what, what's there from from the prophets, from the Psalms, you know, the very way you can't read Paul's letters without uh, without knowing that. And the Magnificat today was a perfect example. Oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. The important thing is that both testaments are our Bible, are our scripture. Oh, yes, Part indeed. of it, the first Old Testament we share with with the Jewish um, faith, but both both parts mm -hmm. are our Bible. We don't have just one. <laughs> it's oh. not just the new and and yeah. yes and what i tend to say old testament but not in the sense of being you know old and to be discarded but um more like old things can be very valuable oh. go to an antiques shop so it's it's it has a longer tradition mm -hmm. which and you can't say christian scriptures and mean new testament the Christian scriptures begin with the book of Genesis. Hmm. So, you know, that's another part of the terminology that we sometimes, sometimes people say Christian scriptures and they mean New Testament. And I think, no, uh, Christian scriptures uh, have, have all of those traditions, all of that literature as part of it. It's all, we believe, the word of God. Very much so. So it's time. Um, so wish everybody um, a blessed week, and when we'll see you soon uh, next next week, we'll come around very quickly, and uh, we'll have a very busy uh, Christmas time, particularly with uh, the Christmas Day being on on the Monday. So you, you might have some decisions to make how many masses you go. <laughs> we won't we won't lay down any rules, but we'll we'll see how creative you can be with the opportunities that you have. Okay. Thank you. So blessings to everybody. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David, too.